You guys ready for God's word? Amen. 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 Good morning, Christian Mission. Yay. Good to see everybody here this morning. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. That's our theme for this year. Be still and know that I am God. We've been on a series in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God calls us all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we have been doing a thorough investigation research on that word good, the Greek word agathos. And uh, this morning we're looking at the definition of agathos. It means agreeable. And if you, uh, I don't know where it is there, I have it highlighted in mind, good, pleasant, agreeable. So uh, that's part of the definition of this. It says in the Amplified, once again, we are assured and know that God, being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Agreeable or enjoyable or pleasurable or pleasant. That's part of the definition. Part of the definition of agreeable is willing to agree to something. Now, if you're going to be agreeable and agree to something, it's important to know what you're agreeing to. <laughs> and it's important to know what you're going to agree with. It's really important to know what we're agreeing with. <clears throat> you see, uh, this morning what we're really looking at is agreeing with God's word. Because if you want to be agreeable with something, there's no better place to go than to God's word. Let me tell you something. What we're really looking about this morning is what God's word says about us in his word. As Christians, as believers, what does God's word say about us? Because many times for us as Christians, it's easier to believe the lie of the enemy and what he says about us and our own thoughts that we have about ourselves rather than what God's word actually says about us. So that's what we're looking at this morning is agreeable and what God's word says about us. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, says God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. <clears throat> Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's in the New Living Translation. It says that we are his masterpiece. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like God's masterpiece. Sometimes I feel like a piece, it's just not masterful. And I don't know if you're the same way or not. But God's word says that you, if you know the Lord and I, we are his masterpiece. Our, our feelings, our emotions are always real but they're not always accurate. That's why normally if you're making a decision based on your feelings and on your emotions, it's going to be a very poor decision. That's not a, something to make decisions based on. They're always real. We experience them. We live them. We have emotions and we have feelings and we go through them. And they're always real what we're going through, but they're not always accurate. God's word is always accurate. And he says that we are his masterpiece. We are the culmination. As a matter of fact, even going back to the book of Genesis in the days of creation, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And we get up and then it was, God has created, creates man and he says, and it was very good. He's saying, you are my masterpiece. You are the top, you are the best. Although we don't feel like that. Why? Because one, Satan still tempts us to sin. You know what? We're a brand new creation of Christ. One of the things I think we're to look at this morning in a little bit. But we're still tempted to sin every day. And because at times when we're tempted, we give in to sin. 
we definitely don't feel like a masterpiece at that point in our lives. We normally start feeling bad about ourselves. We have to remind ourselves in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of life, law of life and liberty has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And remember, that's right after Paul said in Romans chapter 7, starting with verse 14, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. In other words, I have the sin of commission and the sin of omission. I have both sins living in me. Even after, even as an apostle, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do. And then he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me? And then he says, Thanks be to Jesus. Because it's through him that he saves us. And it's through him that we are his masterpiece. And it's through his blood. When God sees me, when he sees Dave Reed, he doesn't see every sin I've committed. He sees Jesus' blood that washes away all my sin. That's right. And he says, Dave, you are my masterpiece. Even though I don't feel like his masterpiece all the time. I don't know about you. Maybe you do. My experience has been most of us don't. Most of us go the opposite direction of that. So I'm asking you this morning to agree with me and what God's word is saying about us, that we are his masterpiece. The way I stand up here right now, even today, I'm his masterpiece. Amen. With my strengths, with my weaknesses, with all of who I am, we are his masterpiece. That's one of the things that God's word says about us. And then a scripture I just quoted, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creature. The old, how much, I haven't memorized a new creation and I was reading it, so I came in with the creature. That's kind of both put together, so that's okay. We can be that. If you don't know how to say it, it's a creature, okay? That's the word. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now here, we have four different things that God's word says about us as his children, as believers. And once again, I'm asking us all to just understand, we just have to agree with what God's word says about us. Yeah. It says, you are a new creature. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it says. It says we're a new creature. We're a new creation. Yes. The old things have passed away. Behold the new. That we're a new creation in Christ. Like I said earlier, sometimes we don't believe that because we still sin at times in our lives. And if you're like me, I probably sin every single day of my life. One day I probably did it more than once. <laughs> it's part of being human. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt my Lord like that. And yet we still do it. And so we have to remind ourselves we're a brand new creation in Christ. Brand new. That's what being born again means. And when Jesus said, you must be born again. And so we have to live. What is it? First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we sin, remember when we sin, our relationship with God stays intact. We're still as children. That relationship never goes away. But the fellowship the communion, the, the intimacy, that gets broken. So when we confess our sins, 
and we run back into Jesus' arms, which is what we should do as soon as we do sin. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us and then clean us. I see uh, David back there. Most people call him William, but since uh, his middle name is named after me, I call him David. <laughs> David back there has his diaper on. When he sins, they get to clean that mess up. That's what God does with us. He takes our messes that we make and he cleans us all up and makes us all nice and new again. That's exactly what he does. So we are a brand new creation. That's what God's word says about us. And he says that God gave us the ministry of reconciliation to walk in that. Because he's reconciling the world to himself. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to use us to help people reconcile with him. Get to know him. Have that sweet fellowship with him. So we are reconciliation because he's using that for, he's using us for his kingdom to do that. And then it says that we are God's ambassador in verse 20. That we are his representative. Amen. Now, if you're like me, once again, sometimes I feel like I'm a poor ambassador. Like I'm not doing a good job of representing him. And God says, Dave, you're my masterpiece. Yes, you mess up sometimes. Yes, you make mistakes sometimes. Confess it. Run back to me. I'm going to keep using you. Ch Church, we're not going to never sin again until we're with him for eternity. Yeah. When we're down here, we're going to struggle with sin. Keep struggling with it. Don't say, don't give in. Don't be like the Gnostics who said all matter is evil, which actually we're doing that on Saturday morning, I think. Like the Gnostics who said all matter is evil. And so they had two different groups in the Gnostics. And... Uh, one got totally into libertarianism. Since all matter is evil, the sin I commit doesn't mean anything. So that they were trying to infiltrate the church and become a part of Christianity, the Gnostics were. And uh, they thought all matter was evil, therefore Jesus could not have come into flesh. Therefore I can sin and do whatever I want, and it's not even a problem, it's not bad. And then the other side went into what I think is called asceticism, if I remember. And they got really into beating the body and trying to be as absolutely perfectly good as you can, which leads to guilt and shame and condemnation, which is where a lot of Christians live because we do sin. Especially if you're trying to get God to love you through being good enough or not sinning. And every time you do sin, you know that you're not good enough and God can't love you. It always will lead you to guilt and shame and condemnation. Every single time. If you were with me on Wednesday nights, we went through the book of Galatians last year. We talked about that all the time. Yeah. So many Christians are still trying to serve the law to earn God's favor and to earn his love. And every time you do that, it will lead you to guilt and shame and condemnation. Every single time. Yeah. The law wasn't given to save us. The law was given to show that we can't keep it, and only one can, and his name is Jesus. Amen. He kept it. He went to the cross. He took the sins of the whole world upon him, and he, his blood washed it all away, the final sacrifice. That's why the law is given. We don't throw the law out. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. The law is still good, and it still does what it does, and it shows us at times we can't keep it to run back into Jesus' arms. Amen. And to run back to his cross and Amen. run back to his grace and his mercy, his mercy and his forgiveness. So as an ambassador, that's what we keep doing. As, as Christians, that's what we keep doing. That's why, that's why when the disciples said, how, often, how many times should we forgive somebody? They said seven times. And Jesus said, no. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. And remember, you don't count out to 490. Say 491, you're done. <laughs> that means we need to keep forgiving each other just the way he forgives us. Because yes. let me tell you, like I said, Aaron and I are celebrating 40 years of marriage this coming July. And I probably heard her the same way over 490 times in those 40 years. So I need a lot of forgiveness from her. And so we extend that forgiveness. 
and we have the relationship and we keep going and we work through. We are as ambassador church. I'm just asking you to agree with God's word tells us. Yeah. And at times, like I said, it's easier to believe Satan's lies that we're no good, that we'll never be good enough, that we have no worth, that we have no value, that we're, we should be walking in shame. We should have condemnation. All that stuff's from Satan. That's not from the Lord. But it's easier to believe that about ourselves so often than what God's word really says about us. And then the last thing it says here, and this one's really difficult for us. It says, he who made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in him. Remember, sanctification, word holy, I mean, set apart, set apart from sin, set apart to holiness. And there's three parts of sanctification. There's positional sanctification where we are in Jesus' blood and we are his masterpiece. And he is there and he sees, he doesn't see our sins. He sees Jesus' blood covering our sins. That's positional sanctification. And then there's progression. That's called living out everyday life and walking with the Lord and progressing and getting closer and being transformed from glory to glory. That's progressional sanctification. That's progressional that we're living it every single day. And in that, that's where we struggle believing that we are the righteousness of God in Him. But positionally, it will never change. We're His child. We will spend eternity with Him. And by the way, the third one is eternal. When we're finally with them forever in glory, we don't have to worry about it anymore. Amen. You are the righteousness of God in Him. Now, it's really important that you see this, and I should say, see that we see this and we agree to this, because when we quit, when we quit seeing ourselves with the lies that Satan keeps giving us. And we start seeing ourselves, what God's word says about us. We start living in it. We start walking in it. Like I said, we base so many of our decisions on our feelings. And our feelings are saying, we're not worthy. We're not good enough. We can't get there. And if that's the way you stay, that's where you stay. That's where you're going to live. When you're agreeing with God's word and you're saying, I'm the righteousness of God in him. Even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't think like it. I'm still the righteousness of God in him. We will act upon that. And we will act like we are the righteousness of God in him. We will act like we are his ambassadors. And, and it's, it's life changing. There's freedom. That's right. Jesus, for freedom I came to set you free. Yes. And so many people, even in the church, are walking in bondage. Now, once again, I'm not saying it's okay to sin. I'm not giving you permission to sin. God still hates sin. Mm -hmm. What I'm giving you permission to do is to agree with God's word and what it says about us. That the sin that we have, he took on that cross and he washed it all away. That's been dealt with. So when we sin and the fellowship's broken, confess it, run in his arms and get that fellowship going again. This is something else. It says in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father as in, he in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. We all know salt is for flavor and it's for a preservative. It does both. And if you like luck, who sits out in the foyer every Sunday. He's kind of our security out there. He just watches over us. When Luck gets his meal, the first thing he does is take the salt and just start dumping salt on it. He doesn't taste it. He just starts, as a matter of fact, we had Luck over for dinner one night. 
And uh, my wife gets offended when people do that. She thinks they should taste your food the way she seasoned it before they ever do anything and see if they like it. And then if they don't like it, then they should add their seasonings. So I warned Aaron. I said, Aaron, when luck comes over, he is not going to taste your food. The first thing he's going to do is grab the salt and just start dumping it on there. And said, don't be offended. It's going to happen. So we had luck over. He, she brought him food. First thing he did was grab the salt and just start going. And she was ready for it. and It was all good. By the way, Aaron's a very good cook. She's a really good cook. So, And I understand what she's saying. And I understand Luck's side too. My question for me is, if I'm the salt of the earth, what are people tasting? Or they say, oh man, that's such a, that's a great flavor. That really adds to it. Oh, that makes it better. And being preserved spiritually, am I able to help those around me be preserved spiritually? Am I being the salt of the earth? The way Jesus is calling me to be the salt of the earth. Because I don't know about you, but I like salt. I love garlic salt. When I have a steak of red meat, garlic salt goes on it every single time. It just, look, people are starting to drool out there. <clears throat> it, it makes it, it taste so good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. He's good. So we're the salt of the earth and we are also the light of the world. Amen. We're to be shining for him. We, we reflect his glory and his glory comes out of us because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are living inside of us. Jesus is also the light of the world. He said both. He said he is the light of the world and we're the light of the world. Both are true. And we're to be shining everywhere we go. The one thing good about the world getting darker all the time, because in my opinion, we, the world keeps getting darker, at least the United States keeps getting darker and darker spiritually, that just means that the light shines brighter and brighter. And people and animals are drawn to the light. I mean, that's why you have these lights. For all the moths and all the bugs, and you put them out there. If you've been ever sitting outside, you hear it going, zzz, zzz. you know what? And the bugs are drawn to the light. When I was young, when they were having a big grand opening of some place, they would take the old World War II spotlights that they had to try to see planes in the air. And they'd get two or three or four of those spotlights and you'd be driving and you'd see this light going across. People my age can all relate to me right now. I don't know if the younger generation, do you guys have seen that? Yeah, no, they take a light and it'd be going like this and they'd be going different directions and trying to get your attention because people are drawn to it. And they go, let's go see what's happening over there. Let's go check that out. And it's just to get you there. We're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. When we're shining for the Lord, we can't help it. When we have Jesus, He's naturally shining through us. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I keep praying, Lord, shine brighter in me every single day. Every single day, help me to shine brighter. Help me to shine brighter. Help me to shine brighter. Help me to taste better. Help me to shine brighter. Help me to be the salt. Help me to be the light that you've called me to be. Because he says, we are the salt and we are the light. Once again, once we understand that's what we are, and it doesn't matter what you think about yourself, doesn't matter what you feel, that's what you are. When you keep looking at that, you'll start believing it. When you believe it, you'll act out on it and you'll live it. And we'll be the light that he's called us to be. And then God's word says, in Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us within us. You know what that says to us? That we're powerful. Amen. 
Once again, I don't care if you feel powerful or not. That's what God's word says about you. <coughs> Acts 1 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be the light of the world. You shall be the soul of the earth. Amen. You will receive power. Both times is dunamis power. If God's word is telling you, he's telling me that we are powerful. If you don't agree with it, if you don't know it, we're not going to walk in it. But when you realize you're powerful, you'll walk in it. Let me tell you about young bucks. And by young bucks, I mean young men. <laughs> young bucks spar. And I'm talking about deer. You know, they'll get down and they get in and they start sparring. And young guys do. And when young males are growing up and they start developing, and especially if they're trying to be an athlete, and they're pumping weights and they're getting bigger and they're getting stronger and getting bigger and getting stronger. Sometimes they want to test themselves and see how strong they are. And the way to do it is to get physical and see, you know what, I'm tougher than you and I can beat you up and I can do this. When they start believing that they're becoming powerful, they want to see how powerful they are. You know, my brother-in-law, the Navy SEAL, said the same thing. He said, when you're out training to be a SEAL and you become a Navy SEAL, and you have all the training that they put into you, you want to go out and use it. You want to go out and, and live it. Yeah. You see, when you start realizing that you're powerful the way you are right now, who you are in Christ right now, and who Christ is in you right now, you start walking in power. And when, and when you're there and God tells you to go lay your hands on that person and pray for them, you go step out in the power. Yeah. And sometimes the Lord just say, I believe, help my unbelief. Because most of the time when God tells me to do something, it's like I feel the Holy Spirit prompting. And at the same time, I'm thinking, is that really you, God? Am I really supposed to do this? I really don't want to do this. Do you really want me to do this? And I go back and forth. And then we say, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And I'll step out and do it anyway. And walk in power. And walk in strength. Ephesians six ten says, "Finally, be strong in the Lord, and the strength of His might." That's right when we're getting started to put on the full armor of God. Yeah. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Walk in His power. You are powerful. Now, to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power. That works within us. One more scripture on this. We looked at this last Sunday. I'm not going to really comment about it a lot. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear or of timidity, but of power and love and sound mind or discipline, depending right. on your translation. Power. Yeah. You. Me. We. Are Powerful. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the most un misunderstood scriptures that people take out of context. You're no more powerful when you have two of you than when you're by yourself because God is all powerful. And because God's inside of you, you don't go from more powerful to more all powerful. You're already all powerful. You don't have to worry about that. It doesn't mean that we're more powerful. You have it. it you have it right now. Yes. It's in you right now. So many Christians are like genies. They're all powerful, but they spent their whole life bottled up, never walking in the power. The movie Aladdin. The kids' movie from Disney. All oh, powerful genie wrapped up in this tiny little. Christians live their whole lamp. Thank you. Creature. So many Christians. We have the power, but we never walk in it. We don't use it. It doesn't do any good to have the power and have it just sit there and not use it. 
So when we start agreeing with God's word, and this is what God's word says, and I just gave you three scriptures showing you what God's word says about it. It's time to walk in it. And I pray you guys are. If you're not, I pray maybe the Holy Spirit really grab a hold of you this morning and say, I'm going to walk in that power. I'm going to step out. It's in me and I'm going to use it. And then the last thing I want to um, talk about is God's word says, and there's a lot more of these I could do, by the way. I just chose some. There's a lot more that I could. We could, we could spend a whole year just going through this. It says that you are victorious. That's right. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are victorious. The war has been won. Jesus won the war through the cross and the resurrection. There's still battles taking place, but the war's been run, and we're victorious. Amen. We win. Amen. Amen. And if you're like me, especially when I was young, that's really important. Because I was a very poor loser when I was young. I was terrible. You know, uh, when I grew up, and my dad was a pastor, most of you know that. The church's position was you don't pay the pastor enough to live on. So we always were hurting for money. Um. Uh, I always had my hand-me-downs from my cousins. I mean, the jeans went from Jim to Bob to John to Dave, my three cousins first. But you know what? And then my mom would go buy the old patches and, and put the iron and put the patches on the jeans. You guys remember that time? Now you, now you buy them with the holes in already. I never figured that one out. When I was younger, buying patches to keep them going, and now they put it. Now of them, some are so torn up, it's just like they don't even have pants on. I didn't get any. Anyway, bring it back in. You are victorious. Victory. That's what God's Word says. That's right. And when we agree with God's Word, we'll be walking in victory. The, like I said, there's still battles taking place. It's still happening but we'll be walking in victory. Like I said, they didn't pay him enough, so we didn't have a lot of money. A really big treat for my family, a really big treat when I was growing up, was to go down to Denny's in San Clemente off Pico and to get a milkshake. That was a really big thing. As a matter of fact, when I grew up, they had a drive-in theaters. You don't see those much anymore. The other ones were what we called walk-in theaters. I had been in a walk-in theater one time in my life growing up because we couldn't afford to go to walk-in theaters. We could only afford to go to drive-in theaters. And we just grew up that way. And we need to be walking in the victory that God has for us. Because that stuff isn't about victory or not. Real victory is spiritual. What really matters is the spiritual and everything. So it says that we're victorious. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the question. Are you going to agree with what God's word sharing about you this morning? Are you going to think about this throughout the day and start dwelling on this? So you keep thinking about it so we agree, agree and agree and agree? Or are you just going to get up here today and walk out of here and go back to the way life is going through and just going through the motions? Because we have a choice. We can take this and what God's word says and we can start living it and walking in it and being kingdom changers for him, real kingdom changers for his kingdom. Or we can leave here and say that was a good message you preached, but we just go out and keep going back to the way life's been going. I don't know about you, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. As for me and my house, we're going to agree with God's word says about it. And I've already shared, I struggle with this quite a bit in my life at times. I mean, I'm real with you. I struggle with it. That's okay. That's the struggle's right. real. God is realer. That was the theme I had one year. No, actually, it was just in my sermon. The struggle is real, but God is realer. Agree with what God says. And then step out. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly, I thank you, Lord. 
for the price that you paid. For our shame that you took on the cross. Yes, Lord. For our condemnation that you took on the cross. That you declare that we are victorious. Because you've already won the war. And I pray, Father, for every Christian in this room right now, Holy Spirit, be, be speaking to us and helping us in this, Lord. We need your help with this, Father. And to be the people that you've called us to be. And I thank you the, for this, Lord. And uh, while everybody's praying and everybody has their eyes closed, maybe you're here and you've never accepted the Lord. You don't even know what I'm talking about this morning. Holy Spirit doesn't need that. He can still get through to you. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you don't know Him, but you would like to know Him and have a relationship with Him, He only comes in by invitation. And if you want Him in, I'm just inviting you and asking you to stand up and come down front. We'll pray together. You can invite Him in best decision you ever make anybody here would like to do that this morning then Father I pray every person in this room does know you and has a personal relationship with you and now Father I'm praying for every single Christian in this room nobody's looking we'll have our eyes closed but maybe today you're going to say, Lord, I'm going to devote myself to agreeing with what your word says about me. I'm devoting myself. And Lord, I'm asking for your help in, in helping me to agree with what your word says about me and then walking in what you've called me to be and you say I am. And I pray that for every Christian in this room. And then if you're watching me on YouTube and you would like to accept the Lord this morning, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, Daddy, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I need you. I confess all my sin to you. I ask that you, through your blood, make it as white as snow. I invite you into my life. Come in. Be my Lord, my Master, my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk in that power that your Word declares that is inside of me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close in song to him. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. Worship his holy day. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. I worship your holy
Bless you.